Hi everyone, welcome to our virtual book club. My name is Karen Dre Sadi and I'm the program manager at the Women Executive Network. We are very pleased and honored to have Christine Dagenet here with us today and I'm also very pleased to introduce her. Christine is our very own WXN Top 100 2020 Award winner and the founder and CEO of Brightwire, a premier leadership development and executive coaching firm where she leads a team of highly skilled executive coaches and leadership experts enabling high performing leaders, teams and cultures in times of complexity. Her firm is behind the leadership development strategy of some of Canada's top organizations. Christine is an active corporate citizen, a passionate entrepreneur, and a published author, writing the intentional MBA to inspire the next generation of powerful leaders. And now I would like to pass it on to Christine. Enjoy the session, everyone. Thanks very much, Karen. And uh, wherever you are, uh, good morning or good afternoon. I'm just going to share my screen so that we have a bit of uh, slides to guide us through our exciting conversation today. So let me just take a moment uh, to do that. Now, I want to make sure we'll just do a little bit of a, a thumbs up if possible. Well, I actually would love to have you guys turn your cameras on. If you're in a position to turn your camera on, to uh, provide some engagement. We're expecting a, a great group today and also an intimate group that we'll be able to have some good conversation with. So if you're able to do that, that is greatly appreciated. And let's take a look. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, Faruzi. Thank you very much. Looking forward to some few more faces on the screen. So can you can you guys see my slide okay? Does it work, Faruzi? I'm gonna count on you, Darby, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> I get it, you guys. This is our virtual, virtual world. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi. Thank you very much, you guys. Awesome. Okay, so we have, uh, as the list here continues to grow, we're expecting a really great group today. And uh, we have had over 30 different organizations register. And, you know, this is a topic and this book is really about helping people be intentional about their development. And it happens to be tied to supporting people in MBA programs. So I'm gonna just kick it off and just really walk us through um, how we're gonna spend our time together today and tell you a little bit about myself and my organization. So I am, as <clears throat> excuse me, Karn mentioned, uh, the founder and CEO of Brightwire Leadership. And Brightwire is a leading firm in Calgary that's responsible for supporting individuals, teams and organizations in building the leadership capability that they need for the future. And essentially everything we do is about developing people to achieve their greatest performance and potential. And at Brightwire, we like to say, helping A players find their plus. That's really the best way to summarize what we do. Now, myself personally, I've been in the adult learning and leadership development space my entire adult career. And that's one of the reasons that personally I was drawn to write a book to help people enable their development. I did my executive MBA at Haskane School of Business at the University of Calgary 10 years ago. You guys, I'm not sure how that has happened so quickly. Time is flying. And um, when, I, when I did the program, I really realized that it would be very easy to not put everything into it and just be able to graduate with three letters. And as an individual, very much against just sort of riding the wave to get a credential that won't serve you well, I was very passionate about helping many others find a way to be intentional about their development. And this is the great team of people that I have been able to lead through many, many years in helping different organizations. One of the organizations that uh, we've worked with as well, has been a few different universities in helping build a leadership capability and specifically working in an executive coaching capacity with MBA and executive MBA programs. And myself, I've personally provided coaching services to over 500 leaders over the years, navigating their educational experience. And so the book that we're going to take a look at today is truly um, a summary of a, a lot of those experiences, but also a lot of experiences that we use as professional executive coaches and leadership development specialists, helping people just take ownership of their career and just be very intentional about what they want to create. So let's take a little bit of a, a look. And of course, it's just been an honor to be uh, recognized as one of Canada's top 100 women, and particularly during a year of a global pandemic, 
where my organization has seen uh, exponential growth and you're now looking at a team of 14 of us uh, strong. So we are out of Calgary and we work with companies across North America. So let's get focused. Let's really dig in. You're here to learn about the Intentional MBA and what you can expect from the book. And as those of you continue to log in, I do welcome you to open your camera if you're comfortable. Uh, we will have space to do Q&A and discussion today. And um, we'll be reading a bit of material from this book right here as we uh, progress the conversation. So the Intentional MBA, a guide to maximizing your decision, your experience, and your investment. And you know, it's quite fun as an author to be able to look back and really realize that the amount of effort and energy that goes into writing a book. Matter of fact, this book was originally titled The Mindful MBA until about you know, two months prior to production. And what we realized was it wasn't just about mindfulness. Mindfulness might be a state, but it's really about intentionality to get the most out of how you're investing in yourself. And um, we wanted something that was you know, strong and long lasting. So just a bit of behind the scenes as an author, uh, there's a lot of decisions that go into even just what you're looking at right now, let alone the content. A guide to maximizing your decision experience and investment. That provides a little bit of um, insight as to who this book is for. So this book is a book written by MBAs and I'll acknowledge my wonderful co-author in a moment, Renee Francis. It's a book written for MBAs by MBAs. But you don't actually have to be an MBA because the, the tools and the strategies covered in this book that we'll learn about today are truly universal. That said, this book really has three core sections to it and multiple chapters within. The first section is helping you understand how to make the best decision to invest in yourself. A lot of times we encounter, and through my profession, I work with people who say, you know, my boss says I need to get an MBA who, you know, will proceed further in the organization. Or I kind of feel stuck, so maybe I should just do an MBA because, I don't know, isn't it like what I should do is kind of the next best thing. And so we're really, you know, for making decisions with intentionality and making decisions for yourself, not for anybody else, because that's the only way you're going to get through an experience like an MBA or an executive MBA. So the first section is about, I haven't yet enrolled, but I'm curious. And we have lots of tools and strategies to help you make the best decision for yourself. So let's say you opt in, you register, you get accepted into an MBA program. What about the experience? So many times MBAs and any graduate degree, not just MBA, we get in, we have all these ambitious objectives and then the reality hits. And often in the MBA world, you're working full time as well. That could be very possible in some cases. So suddenly you're busier than you ever thought you would be. You hit this wall and the objectives that you set for yourself no longer are guiding your decisions, no longer are shaping your experience. So for example, I might be a professional in human resources and leadership development. So that wouldn't be what I would want to learn in the MBA. I would wanna do all the finance case studies and I would wanna do the economics assignments and get better at those things. But when the pressure's on, guess what I'm doing? I'm now taking on the things that I know the best because it's easier. And so we don't want that for people. So you need actual strategies to be intentional about your experience. Okay, so that's kind of part two. And we'll talk more about this, your decision, your experience, and then your investment. So what happens after you graduate? A lot of questions. And people look at their investment. And again, MBA or any graduate degree going, how do I get a return on my time invested? So we tackle that. And this, uh, this has been a lot of feedback from, you know, leaders in industry who have MBAs from five, 10 years ago, really finding value in this segment of the book in particular, because there are strategies on how to ensure that you are continually connecting back to what you've learned and that you are, you know, connecting to the return on the investment that's possible, no matter what stage of the game you're at. So this book was created for people interested in an MBA currently in the experience and just trying to survive, let alone thrive, and then looking to maximize the investment after they've graduated. So that is what, uh, what you're looking at here. Now, my co-author, Renee Francis, uh, we met through an MBA program, uh, Go Figure, of course, and uh, she was one of very few um, uh, leaders who was as passionate about creating intentional experiences, because if you can show up 
and be intentional. We really believe this every day. You can accomplish greater things with your life, full stop. And so Renee said to me, Renee was a, a senior leader, corporate communications executive, um, working with a company that many of us know very well, running their, uh, their very well-known editorial uh, magazine feature. And she said to me, Christine, we need to write a book. And I was like, well, you know what, Renee, I've always wanted to write a book, but I have like a lot of things in here and they sound good when they come out, but when they're on paper, they're really not so good. So she's like, well, let's partner together. And I said, you know what, we're off to the races. So two MBAs partnering together to write a book for MBAs. And that's what, uh, that's what we're going to take a look at today. So, and those little grad caps as well are always really, uh, that was a fun, fun thing to kind of think about. So let's look at our objectives for our time. Um, I will share my passion for being intentional with you. And I think uh, perhaps that's come across already a little bit. We'll tell you about the intentional MBA, the book, what we thought about, what we considered, what our challenges were, how long it took to write. That's always a funny one as well. Um, we're going to do a bit of a reading and I'm going to bring you into two really uh, key strategies that are covered in the book that are irrelevant of MBA or not, that are truly universal, particularly in the business world today. And we're going to talk about understanding and articulating your personal brand and the difference between a personal and a corporate brand. And then we're going to talk about how do you build instant credibility? Because, wow, is that ever harder to do in the world that we're living in today? And um, I don't know about you guys, but we all seem to have a lot less time and a lot more to do. So how do you leave a lasting impression? And how do you do that with great confidence? We're going to talk about those two things through reading today. We'll do some Q&A and then we'll uh, hand it back over to the wonderful WXN team to wrap it up. So that is the plan for our time. And I'm thinking that sounds okay with everyone. A few nods on the screen. Yeah, good. Okay. Thank you guys. So let's take a look. Now, this is uh, something I wanted to share with you right out of the gate. And uh, it's almost like beginning with the end in mind. And for any of us who have had experience in, in communications, you know, you're writing the executive summary last. And in the author's world, the executive summary is the dedication. And so here's how we chose to dedicate our book. Hello, this book is dedicated to you and your curiosity. Here's your MBA exploration, and may you enjoy many happy returns. And that truly really is the premise of this book. And the word that I'd like to highlight here is curiosity. That is one of the consistent factors that we find anyone who's aspirational about their professional development has as an automatic baseline. And so if you're curious and you're interested in learning more, the idea behind a dedication is that it captures that broad audience and it really brings you in to the possible, uh, the, to the possibilities of the experience of the material that you're about to read. So just wanted to leave you with that dedication. Now, if it's not noticeable enough, passion definitely let us hear. Renee uh, moved to San Francisco at the beginning of our co-authorship. And about a year later, after working virtually already for a year, the global pandemic hit. So now I'm sharing a little bit with you about how long it actually took to write the book. And we'll talk more about the process as well. Now we went from being scheduled to sign, do, to do book signings at Barnes and Noble, downtown San Francisco, to doing a virtual book launch and navigating a pandemic. So it was a very interesting time to publish as an author and we'll talk more about that. But what made it all okay is that this is a passion project for us. We didn't write this book because we wanted to generate revenue. By the way, as an author, you don't do that. That's not the reason why. There's additional incremental opportunities that can come as a result, but it's not about the book sale. It's about, for us, our passion and sharing development strategies with the world around us. And so why we wrote it, we are passionate about making the most of every experience. We are passionate about being intentional and learning every day, just continuous development, always seeking to be better, or as we say at Brightwire, helping A players find their plus. Who doesn't want an A plus, by the way? Like, come on, I know it's the same GPA as an A, but I always want the plus, I don't know about you guys and uh, sharing our lessons learned and just scaling them in a way that's impactful for more people. Um, additionally, we are MBAs and executive MBAs with leadership development and communications expertise. So we thought, well, the partnership here makes great sense um, to co-author a book. 
Another reason is we really believe that an MBA experience or any graduate degree experience, so any experience that you're investing in yourself truly, when approached mindfully and with intention, can be a transformative and rich process. Otherwise, it is possible, unfortunately, to mail it in and get essentially nothing that you would hope to achieve out of your investment. So we don't want that for anybody, hence why we wanted to capture these strategies. The last one here, and, and arguably one of the most important, is that adventure was a core value for us. And we knew writing a book for the first time would be an adventure. And we knew that we had the information, we had the experience, we had the capability, but we had never written a book before. And that in itself is an adventure. And if you don't happen to appreciate the, uh, the back and forth required and the tenacity, um, then it's not gonna go very well. But that said, for us, it was something that we were passionate about and that we really appreciated in the process. So let's just talk a bit about and shine a spotlight on what does intentionality mean for us before we kind of start to look at the different components of the book. So we approach this like true MBAs. So what actually does that mean? We realized if we were going to form a partnership and actually a business together in order to pay for publishing the book and, and the marketing around it and actually get book royalties at the end of the day, we need to actually form a business partnership. So we did it like true business professionals. We had a team, we had a charter, we had agreements. We knew how we were going to handle conflict. We had a marketing plan, we had a budget, and we had responsibilities that we shared. And we lived up to them for sure. And we'll talk about the conflicts that we have and how they actually created a better product. Um, we, as I mentioned, we had virtual collaboration since the onset of the project. So come the pandemic, I already felt like a pro, let alone the fact that Brightwire leadership has been servicing clients across North America virtually for almost ever. So it was just sort of a, a, nice, uh, a nice sort of build or opportunity. And then reality check on timing. Now, this was always interesting because you start, you know, writing a book and you might think, okay, so this is about a year project, maybe a year and a half. And for us, you know, that might be possible depending on the author and, and how you prioritize it for sure it is possible. Uh, for us, this took two and a half years until from idea, from concept, right through to having this beautiful physical copy of this great book in front of me mailed to my home. It was a wonderful experience. And so that was because this was in addition to what we did for a living and our priorities uh, that we have every day. I have two young children. We have a very active lifestyle of a wonderful husband. In addition to leading a significantly growing organization over those years, those two and a half years for both Renee and myself were the busiest in our careers. So what did we do? We stuck to our Sunday evening virtual book meetings where we would make progress. And essentially, I would record the concepts and the thinking, and I would download my recordings, and Renee would work her magical communications approach, and she would put it into words. And that was how our partnership unfolded. So as I mentioned, we launched in the middle of the pandemic and had to stay really intentional about that. We did have a choice. Do you launch, you know, like I, I, would, I would love to have a group of people together to do a bit of a book signing in person. I mean, that was something that we definitely did not happen, but we had a few virtual celebrations and uh, virtual presentations to the book. And, um, and, and that was a choice that we actively made, but we're obviously still sharing the information and communicating about uh, the book as it continues to get to market. We also had many differing positions. And so we would come across decisions and I would propose that we write about it in a totally different way. And Renee would put her communications hat on and say, but Christine, not everyone else talks like that, or that's not a way that is generally understood, or you need to scale it back or vice versa. And, um, and together we were able to just navigate and go, you know what, that's right, let's find a mid zone and create the best product that we can. So it's fun when I read through it, and as an author, you end up reading your book front to back like too many times. When I read through this, I hear my voice and I hear Renee's voice. Uh, beautifully in unison. So it really worked out well that way. Uh, in addition to the real examples we provide from our experiences throughout the entire book. And so we thought it would be fun and it was, but like anything that you do, every journey begins, you know, a journey of a thousand miles, the famous saying begins with one single step. 
So our biggest step was to figure out like, what is it specifically that we wanna put into this book? So what can you expect? Um, really valuable guidance, tools and strategies for your development, whether you are an MBA or not. We've had many people in our coaching practice purchase this book because it actually has tools and I'll tell you about them as we go, that help you navigate your career, that help you discern what you want for your future, filter through all the emotion and actually get really objective and targeted about defining specific career paths. We talk about how do you articulate your transferable skills? It's like we've grown in our careers and we're really good at what we do, but how do I vocalize that in a way that is understood by the person who needs to receive it and moves me from being technical only to actually being able to demonstrate leadership capability. So there's a lot of things in the book that are MBA or not really universal. And how they tie to an MBA is generally people in an MBA program or any graduate degree are looking to advance, are looking to propel their career or take the next step professionally, whatever that might be. And so having those tools and strategies, again, are immediately valuable. Now we have, uh, we had a lot of fun building three personas. And this was a, this was a last couple of months of the project. And we went through it and our editor said to us, and you gotta love your editor, anyone who's ever written a book or currently engaging in writing a book. I know there's a few folks here on the screen right now. Uh, you have your back and forth with your editor and you love them and then you don't love them and then you love them and then you don't. And then at the end, you're like, oh, I love you so much. Thank you for this great book, right? So one of the things the editor helped us with was um, making the examples real and catering the messaging and like the great experience to uh, personas that people could relate to. So you're gonna see three personas through the book and I'll introduce them to you in a moment. Um, and the idea is that every tool and concept that we talk about, uh, kind of they, the personas experience them. So for example, today we're gonna to look at building instant credibility and you will see that through the lens of the three personas and you can choose to read the individuals that you connect the most to. So it's a way to make this entire book actually extremely relatable. And we had fun creating the persona. So we'll look at them in a moment. There's also the chapters, and I alluded to this already, the pre-MBA, so making the decision, during it, the MBA, getting the most from your experience and just never faulting back on what your original objective was, which is so easy to do come semester two when it's just crazy. And then post MBA, no matter how long ago you graduated, maximizing your return on your investment. It's a guidebook. So that's also interesting in this actual uh, book. And I know that some of you have it there in front of you and some of you had it on order. Um, there's, there's lines and pages and questions and action tips. So it's actually meant to be really user-friendly, not arduous, not scary, not daunting in terms of I have to sit down for eight hours to read it. It's like super accessible, very digestible, and it's meant to be written in and highlighted on so that you can keep it as your guidebook, almost like your way to honor your commitment, no matter what stage in your MBA sort of investment you're at. So that is a little bit about the book. Now here are the three personas. The first persona, we had fun with these. So this is MBA Jessica, pre-MBA Jessica. So there's one persona for each stage of the experience, pre, during, and post. So Jessica, Jessica's 28 years old. She's a marketing manager and she's an aspiring entrepreneur who wants to grow and scale her business. Her business is in web design and app development. And she's super, super innovative, really excited, and has very little business acumen. So Jessica's like, I think I need to get an MBA to figure this out so that I can actually grow my business effectively and have the tools that I need to do it really well. So this is Jessica, 28 years old. The next persona we have is Mohammed. And Mohammed's like right in the middle of his MBA. He's 39, he's a mechanical engineer, and he doesn't wanna be pinned to the same job for the next 15 years. So Mohammed's like, I have a super technical background. And um, I also know that I have leadership capability. I need more experience in that space of what I do. And I need to be able to understand how to articulate that so that I can grow in my career and I can move beyond being in pipelines processing and being into you know, senior project director positions over time. So Mohammed decides to take an MBA, but he also has uh, two young children, stalker schedules, a demanding life, and uh, you know his experience many of us can relate to. 
And then the next one here, we have post MBA, we have Lena. So Lena is a vice president of asset integrity. She's 50 years old and Lena feels stuck in her career. She's like, you know what? I went, I did my MBA and nothing's happening. I'm in the same job and it's been five years. So what do I do now? And how do I still get a return on my investment? Because it was five years ago. So we take these three personas through the entire book and you look for their little symbols and you learn to follow them. And we apply all the tools and strategies that we wrote about. And so I would say again, your publisher and your editor definitely know how to help you take the ideas that you think are really great and translate them into ways that resonate with a broader audience. And so this is an example of that. Okay, I'm gonna do one more slide and then I'm just gonna pause for a moment before we do a reading and just see if there are any questions that are coming up now. You're welcome to jump in with questions I do see that the, the chat functionality here as well. So we are able to use that. And we will have a chance to engage formally as we get into the reading and Q&A. But just wanted to let you know, I will pause in just a moment to see if there's anything coming to mind, any comments, uh, curiosities, or questions. Okay, so these are our three personas, Jessica, Mohammed, and Lena. And even naming them, you guys, like that is just a whole conversation in itself. So we'll leave it there. The key strategies in the intentional MBA. So this could, this is one slide and it could be five slides. So there are a lot of real strategies covered in this book, all with the focus of helping you be intentional about your development. So I'm just gonna go through a few of them and just give you an idea of what to expect. And then we'll do, a, uh, I'll open the floor to see if there's any curiosities or questions. And then we're gonna take a look at reading a couple of sections, okay? All right, so the first one here, one of the first strategies that's written about in the book, and I'll kind of just break these out into groups of three, is building a business case for investment support. And arguably this tool, matter of fact, I have been told by many that this tool of how to build a business case has been used not only to have your employer or your board fund your development, like pay for your MBA, but it's also been used to propose a new position, propose a new function, recommend a decision. A business case template is provided in the book and it's been used many times, but it's very much augmented in the book on how to um, you know, build the value proposition around an MBA investment for your employer. And people have literally copied it out and like filled it in and brought it into their bosses and had their bosses approve their MBAs. So it's very well uh, applied tool. The next one we talk about is defining and understanding your return on investment, your ROI. And for many people, this is quantified differently. So we help you think that through because if you're spending 80 to $120,000 or 45, it's a part-time evening MBA to 120,000 executive MBA on yourself, you're going to want to know what does getting a return on that investment look like. And for me, it was never about generating a direct revenue increase in terms of compensation or bonus structure. For me, it was about expanding my network and being able to count on my network to help me scale and grow my business, which has happened exponentially so. And that would be only possible because I stopped to evaluate what specifically does a return for me look like. Other people graduate with the intention of getting a promotion. And they know that in order to get a return on their time and their money invested, that they need to see a minimum 10% increase over the next five years with a parallel increase in bonus structure. And so for each of you to consider that if you are considering an MBA will be important. And a section in this book helps you navigate that decision and that thinking. And just really calibrate your own expectations because if you don't know, it's hard to assess the value. And a lot of people will ask like, what is the long-term value? So for you to know that upfront helps you make the decision. Today, we'll talk about building instant credibility and uh, uh, a new spin on the elevator pitch. Uh, many of us have heard about the elevator pitch before, generally a sales tool or often done in sales training. And for us at Brightwire and for myself as a professional writing this book is really about leaving the impression with those that you're interacting with in a way that you want them to perceive and having it be meaningful, authentic, and lasting. And so we actually walk through that in the book because we actually believe in the MBA program, you have hundreds of opportunities 
to leave an instant, instant credibility, to build credibility quickly and to leave a lasting impression. And recognizing that up front versus after you graduate and wishing you should have done that is ideal, right? That's where the intentionality comes in. So we have a few more here, just telling you a bit about what's in the book. Um, we have this concept called step through meetings. And for those of us in the corporate world, we may be familiar with skip through meetings, a similar concept, but when applied to an MBA, we actually work with a lot of executive MBAs in particular in our coaching services to help them position themselves to their employers differently so that their employers know like, hey, you know what, Sarah is learning these new skills through her executive MBA program. And, you know, she was, you know, doing marketing as a manager really well, but now I see her capability in finance in a way that I wasn't aware of. And that becomes possible through building your brand and also articulating how things are changing for you strategically with your company. So we have a framework, a tool, an actual agenda, how to get the step through meetings, how to ask for them, uh, all included. We'll talk about the personal brand today. So I'm gonna go through that one. And we will also briefly mention our career pathing strategies and tools included in this book. So often those looking at an MBA are looking to evolve their career. They have, you know, particularly in the executive MBA world, been doing what they've been doing for very long. Um, they know they have more career trajectory left. They wanna learn some new skills and particularly post global pandemic and in the height of the great resignation that's occurring around us, Many people are looking to pivot and evolve their skills. So we have these tools called career pathing strategies. We've been using them forever in our coaching practice, like 15 years and refining it over time. That essentially allows you to remove the emotion and the subjectivity and objectively consider what makes you happy and match that to future career paths that you are qualified to deliver on. And it's like, I can make it sound so simple. I know it's like really crazy when you're the one trying to figure that out for yourself. So essentially this tool helps you answer the question when you're already growing up of, I don't know what I wanna be when I grow up further. So that's what our career pathing tool helps you do. And that's uh, included in the book. And then the last couple ones I'll throw into the mix here. And again, this could be five slides, but it's just one. And then we'll just open it up to see if there's any comments at all. Um, articulating and, and our, our, sorry, identifying and articulating your transferable skills. I alluded to this previously. Many of us can say, well, you know, like when someone says to you, okay, Jennifer, Darby, Bina, Suzanne, Mindy, what are you good at? And we're like, oh, you know what? Like, I'm good at a lot of things. Like, okay, well, like, you know, Mindy, tell me more. What specifically you're good at? Oh, I'm a people person. Or I'm really good at marketing and communications or I'm for sure a finance gal or guy. And um, when I ask you, okay, so what makes you really good at finance? I'm really good at Excel, but Excel is not a transferable skill. What specifically enables you, specifically you, Mindy, compared to Jamie, to be good at Excel? Well, I can look at data quickly, discern the complexity and make decisions using information. Okay, now we're talking, right? So decision capability or discerning complexity or skills that you have. And so we have a tool in the book, the Intentional MBA, that helps you identify what your transferable skills are, the ones that are universal and I can rely on you for no matter what project you're leading or what job you're doing, and learn how to talk about them. And in our professional coaching practice, and we serve hundreds of leaders regularly, 90% plus can't articulate past the baseline level. And nowadays in the market to differentiate yourself, it's really important that you can. So there's a tool to help with that. And then there's also a section here where people say, oh, should I use my MBA credential? Where do I use those three letters? Is it tacky to do so in business? Do I put them on my email signature? How does it work? And so that's a really hot debate. And we love having that debate. So we have a whole section on it that has our experience and perspective. So these are a couple of the key strategies in the book. And um, we're gonna read through some of them actually, and then get your thoughts and, and challenge you to take some of this away to put into play. Um, before we do that, I'll just pause for a moment and just open the floor. Are there any comments, curiosities, or any questions from anyone here? 
I just put mine in the chat. Um, so I'm kind of on the fence about doing an MBA. I, I know I want to advance in my career. I just don't know where or how to do it. So this is an option. So I don't know if you can speak to weighing your options or you know, I'm even thinking about starting, like going out on my own. Lots of things in my head. It's basically what I'm trying to say. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. And I'm sure there's lots of people nodding and kind of like, yeah, me too, right? I'm, I'm totally here for that reason. And I'm curious. So appreciate you sharing that. Um, you know, the decision to do an MBA in terms of its value is one that should, you know, be taken very seriously. And I respect that you are for sure. When you're thinking about your optional career paths, one of the first starting points, and this is kind of that career pathing strategies I was just talking about, is learning to identify and really think objectively around what are your conditions of satisfaction? So what, what is a condition of satisfaction? It's when you look back in your career and you're like, you know what, that really made me feel good. I really appreciated that. I loved that part of my job. That is something that we want to make sure that you get as you continue to develop in your career. So you take your conditions of satisfaction, you reflect on them, you learn about your transferable skills, and then you consider what jobs am I qualified for? And more importantly, am I interested in pursuing? And then you map what organizations. Now, if you layer all that together, and this is generally the work that we do in coaching, so it doesn't happen in five minutes, right? And, and it's all in this book as well. When you layer that together, you have a really clear idea of what you want to do to achieve satisfaction in your career, at least over a three to five year term. And we only, we only go up to five years because I mean, what's gonna happen after five years? There's so many questions, like you can't plan for that, right? And then you can say to yourself, okay, so in order to accomplish this, which I feel is my best shot at achieving my conditions of satisfaction in my career, will an MBA help with that? So many people think, well, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to do an MBA. And I would agree if you're going to invest in yourself and you don't know what to do, but you know you want an ac academic education advancement, an MBA is hard to go wrong because it's universal skills. You can't go wrong with business. Everything is a business. It's goods and services traded for business. But at the same time, it's a significant investment. So if you can first, you know, my guidance to you would be first think about what is it specifically that you want and do the work to articulate that career path. From there, that will help you shine the light really brightly on will an MBA help me achieve my objectives. Does that help Jennifer with your question? Yeah, it does, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, you're welcome. You know, when you're passionate about something, right? It's like, oh, I just appreciate that you asked that question because it means you're taking it really seriously, not just kind of going in for three letters and hoping for the best. So is there anything else, any other questions or curiosities from anyone here with us today? There are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, not yeah. sure if people want to read them themselves or I can just read them out for you. Um, but yeah. Jennifer was asking about, um, also, if you identify with more than one persona, um, yeah. what nice. do you do with that? Yeah, thanks, Darby. And yeah, please do read them out for me. I think because I'm sharing, I'm not actively saying yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what do you do if you identify with more than one persona? You follow along both. You know, you absolutely do. This is a very uh, digestible piece of material. Some people can crush through it in two days, a day and a half, depending on how committed you are. Um, and again, it's not arduous, it's really inviting. So I would say you follow along both because the idea between that is you're going to see some different perspectives. So it's just gonna heighten your total awareness and help you make a better decision. So absolutely, Jennifer, they're, uh, they're all there, but it also makes it easy if you are like, Muhammad's my guy, like I gotta follow Muhammad, then you can just skip through Lena and Jessica because you know you're just tra you're trailing Muhammad because that's what you relate most to. So yeah, I'd recommend you read all three of them actually, because they're, uh, if you can't personally relate to all three of them, you definitely have somebody in your life that can, and it just will help you be a better individual leader by supporting awareness of other people's experiences too. So I like the question. Thank you. What else do we have, Darby? Um, Amanda was uh, talking about how she was actually accepted to Queens for the executive MBA program a couple of years ago, but 
opted out of it. And so she's wondering, um, since she's an established business owner, does your book support entrepreneurs or is it more targeted towards employees? Oh, such a great question. So bold. So hi, Amanda. Love that you're here, by the way. That's awesome. Amanda's also pursuing a book writing herself right now. Hey, girl, nice to see you. <laughs> I love it, right? So uh, absolutely both. And uh, we, so for example, that question was probably triggered for you when we talked about the business case and getting like, your employer to pay or your board to pay or using that tool in any other way. So throughout the entire book, we recognize that you might be an employee or you might be the employer yourself as I am and as Amanda is. So 100%. Now the personas are generally uh, employees other than Jessica. Jessica is actually just like us, like founder and CEO, building your business, scaling. So we have two employees and one entrepreneur also for that reason. So that's a good question. There's all those things you got to think about when you're like writing for the whole audience, right? Yeah. Thank you. Nice. Garden, those, are what... all the, those are all the questions we had in the chat, but I also kind of wanted to jump in. And, uh, it's kind of a question, kind of a comment, but um, I actually graduated from an undergrad this year. Um, and so even though I'm not really looking at grad school yet, or if I am interested in further education, but um, just this conversation in itself is inspiring to intentionality and the driven of like wanting the next thing kind of thing is really cool for me. And that I'll definitely, even though it's for the MBA, I'll definitely apply to whatever I end up doing. Yeah. Thanks Jeremy, for that feedback. I'm glad that that's resonating with you. You know, as an, as an author, you have a lot of thinking to do about the title of your book and Renee and I really came together because we were intentional MBAs. And we were the ones that people in our classes came to, to help them through their experience. And we offered perspective shifts and we challenged our cohort members. And because of that, they got the most out of their experience. And so when we thought about the intentional MBA, a guide to maximizing your decision experience and investment, we very much knew that the title itself would be narrow to MBAs. Like when you're at chapters and you're like looking for the MBA book, this is the only one that exists other than D MBA for dummies, which if you want to read that, go ahead, right? So that's done intentionally. But at the same time, when we talk about it, we always say, hey, you know what? You don't have to actually even be looking at an MBA right now because it's packed with all these tools that you see on the screen. They're all about professional development, helping A players find their plus, level up strategies, and also just making the most of the time that you have in your life. You know, because we just, we only have one life to live, or that's my belief anyways, everyone's beliefs are different, but either way, maximize each moment in each day. And so I appreciate again, your feedback and your thinking and the fact that you can see that despite the title saying MBAs, it's almost like the intentional insert here, right? So I, I appreciate that. Okay, well, can you want to jump in with a comment, uh, Christine? This is Juliet here, and I put in the chat that uh, it's actually perfect timing because uh, I'll be done my MBA next week. It was a three-year program, and I did it while I was working full time. Okay. Uh, so everything you have on the slide is pretty much things that have crossed my mind. Some of them I've more or less fumble my way through and figured it out. Yeah. Other things, uh, it's like perfect timing. So really looking forward to uh, what you have to share next. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Juliet, for that feedback. Congratulations. So close. Very exciting. It's a big journey. And, um, you know, I just want to pick up on your word, fumble your way through, right? Because we did, we all did. And like really our vision behind this book is to help less, or help more people having to fumble less less fumbling. Fumbling can be fun though. Like you can learn from it for sure. And there's value there. But when you're in an MBA working full-time as you are as well, uh, it's kind of nice if you could get some strategies up front that just help you navigate with more intentionality. And you know, you guys, we, um, when uh, publishing this book and getting it out to market, we we're in a conversation with some partnerships with uh, universities who run MBA and executive MBA programs. And what you're going to start to see is that this book is part of the welcome and the onboarding package. And the idea behind that is we want to get this information to you before you start. It's still valuable afterwards, absolutely, because you can still be intentional and there's a whole chapter. But what about beforehand? And so, um, yeah, so that's sort of the idea uh, behind the experience here and behind getting this to people first. We had one gentleman actually call both Renee and myself and leave us voicemails and say, look, I found your information online. I've read your book. 
And I have to tell you, this is the book that I needed three years ago before I started my MBA. You need to get it out there and more people need it beforehand because my experience would have been totally different and better if I would have read this before. And we were like, thank you for that excellent feedback. Duly noted. That is our objective, right? So it was it literally, we both got a voicemail from this guy and he was like, almost upset, like not angry, but almost like, I can't even believe that this now exists. It should have existed before. So it was kind of fun, kind of to your point, Juliet. So thanks for sharing. Appreciate that. That's my sentiment as well, um, but better late than never, so. <laughs> well, thank you for that sentiment. Yeah, and you know what, better late than never. That's the whole point about these things, right? And I remember before doing my executive MBA, and again, 10 years ago, like crazy, uh, looking for the book, like MBA, making a decision, MBA, how to get the most out of it, MBA, is it right for me? And Googling all these things, and guess what came up? Nothing, or a whole bunch of blogs with some individual perspectives, which are great, but not necessarily based in significant research and experience over the years. And again, you know, I've personally worked with over 500 executive MBAs myself, let alone members on my team, not just executive MBAs, sorry, MBAs as well. And so, you know, you, we just really wanted to keep the lot for everyone. So that's what we did. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at a couple of uh, pieces of uh, the book and uh, we have some nice time to do this. And, you know, what I'm gonna share with all of us, let me just pull it up here. We can do a little bit of a reading together. So this is fun. We're gonna look at your brand. So for those of you who have the book or uh, will be purchasing the book, this is chapter four and on page 95. And we're gonna go through this together and pause and get your questions and your thoughts and your reactions. And then I'm gonna challenge you to start to talk about your brand and share it with those around you using a really, really great tool called the Instant Credibility Statement. And again, as I alluded to at the beginning here in our opening comments, this is like the heightened new elevator pitch. It's like the, way better elevator pitch. It's like the one that doesn't make it sound like you're trying to sell me something because actually you're not. You're just trying to help me understand who you are and what you're all about and what you want to achieve. Super key. Okay, so my challenge to each of you here as we're reading this is to think about yourself. Think about what questions you have. I'm happy to take any questions around professional development, brand, any of the things we talk about, not just about MBAs, it's about development, period. And, um, to challenge you to think about how you would articulate your instant credibility as well. So are you guys ready for this? Should we do a bit of a reading? Does that work? Okay. So chapter four, I'm just gonna have a little sip of my water here, open up this beautiful book. You can get it in hardcover or soft cover, by the way, but I recommend hardcover because I think it's uh, nicer. That's my, my preferred way. Okay. So here we are on page 95, and I'm just gonna read this for you guys. And the section is called Your Brand. So you are leaving an impression from the moment you apply to the moment you graduate and in all the moments well beyond. As you go through your MBA experience with intention, your personal brand is something to be always aware of. A personal brand is much like the commercial brands we're familiar with in the products and services that we buy. A strong brand is easily recognizable, consistent, and tells customers what they expect from choosing that product. Your personal brand works the same way. It helps you to establish who you are quickly so that your customers or people that you want to build relationships with can choose you. Your personal brand is much more than what you wear or your grooming in your general appearance, although these things are, of course, very important. Your personal brand is your relationships, how you advocate for what's right or wrong, the questions you ask, what you're known for, how you engage others in the learning experience, etc. These are all the things to be aware of and with habit, paying attention to them can become part of a secondary degree of consciousness th throughout your entire MBA experience. Because MBA students go through such intensive experiences together, Often through intensive course weeks and group work, you build trust with your classmates quickly. And that allows you to also let your guard down very quickly. So go with this for a minute, even if it feels uncomfortable at first. Use the chance to open and develop your, your relationship building skills. 
during each interaction, deal with each person as though they could be your future employer, your employee, or your future business partner. You can still have a lot of fun, but consider your personal brand in the context of earning your MBA and what's beyond graduation. Don't underestimate the potential future risks of being complacent about relationship and personal brand building today. When Christine was halfway through her MBA program, she noticed the dress code was starting to slip, particularly on Saturdays. She rallied a few individuals who softly campaigned to put the business back in business school by focusing on what they wore even on Saturdays. In this executive MBA program, class was held on Fridays and Saturdays and the tendency over time, especially as assignments piled up and students got very tired, was to start dressing down on Saturdays. And you guys were talking like Lululemons and flip-flops, okay? The group of the students who committed to staying in business clothes or at least professionally dressed had the strongest network afterwards because they were always viewed as being professional and reliable. How we look and feel affects how we act. That kind of an impression leads to lots of other opportunities to connect and learn on a deeper level. As the saying goes, one of my personal favorites, don't dress for the job you have, which in this case could be an exhausted student working on a Saturday. Dress for the job you want, the career of your dreams, by putting your personal brand into action. Now, let's get beyond clothes and appearance to get your brand truly dressed for your career of your dreams. And there are many ways to do that. Personal brands, and I'm on page 98. I'm skipping over a visual, but we'll show you that visual here in a moment. Page 98. Personal brand is not the same as corporate brand. Your personal brand must resonate with you and it needs to be different than the brand of the company that you work for. Your personal brand can be and often will be complementary to the corporate brand that you work within, but your personal brand should be distinct. You may put your career needs behind those of your client or employer, or you may not enjoy playing politics or selling yourself. I get it, but that's the wrong way of thinking. If you want to succeed past the mid-level of an organization, you need a strong personal brand, one that you've made friends with, one that you are comfortable finding graceful ways to let others know about. A strong personal brand acts as a foundation for a long and rewarding career. So I'm just going to pause there for a moment and just share with you, and I know not everyone can see this, but this is sort of an example of the action tips section that you'll see in the actual book. So I just read this side and then it has actually some questions that I'll read for you that you could actually use to answer in this book and come back to. So if I'm you right now, I'm asking, okay, this is great, this makes sense. How do I actually create my own personal brand? So let's read, creating your personal brand. When describing yourself, write down words or phrases that come to mind for each element. Be as specific as possible in each area. So the first question is about values. What is most important to you in your life? Drivers, what motivates you? Reputation, what are you known for? And you might actually ask other people to help you with that too. And we talk about that in the book as well. Behaviors, what do others see you do? Skills, what are you best at? Image, how are you seen by others? So once you have a chance to reflect and write down some of those questions, the second phase of this is identify the themes from your previous responses and translate them and give it a try into some personal brand statements. So I stand for dot, dot, dot. I am known for dot, dot, dot. And I want to be known for dot, dot, dot. And I'll just pause there for a moment and just invite you to reflect, could you answer those questions for yourself today? What do you stand for? Bina, Suzanne, what are you known for? Patricia, Amanda, what do you want to be known for? Jennifer, Mindy, and those are really key questions. And many people in leadership in particular, or at any stage in their career can't articulate them or, or don't have confident answers because we haven't sat down and just thought about it. So that's the value here in this worksheet and these action tips provided. I'm going to pause there. We'll take a look at another component in a moment, but I'm going to pause there. 
So questions, curiosities, what's resonating with you when we, when we explore this concept of your personal brand? Oh, I giggled at your example of how you dress because I find with everyone working from home now, <laughs> Uh, the outfits have gotten more and more casual. Like I have a colleague, it looks like she's about to go out for a run. She's got her hair in a messy bun. She's wearing a tank top. And I'm like, oh, that's an interesting uh, choice to wear. And then some people now don't even put their cameras on so you can't see them. So it's hard to make a, a connection. Like there's a new woman on my team and I've maybe only seen her once in the past, like since the beginning of of the year so yeah yeah and you know the uh what's interesting about that is the impact on you and your perception mm -hmm. of that individual in the relationship and as much as we yeah. in my profession we study judgments and biases and all the things that go with how we interpret the world around us as humans that is reality like you really do have a chance to make a first impression but I look back at my MBA cohort and as much as grooming and appearance really is only one thing, like if, if, you are, if you have no substance behind your suit, it doesn't matter, right? But it's really an entrance point. And when I look back and I think, who would I put in front of my clients? Who would I choose to partner with? It's going to be the person that had the capability to discern that this is an important relationship building moment and that professionalism is paramount. And that's me looking through my personal values in how I make decisions. And there are many others that are similar. It doesn't have to be a suit. It doesn't even have to be professional. Different industries have different dress codes, but it's about how you show up and how you build that respect and credibility beyond just appearance. But yeah, Jennifer, you're not the only one. You know, when, when we, in this Zoom world, for sure, uh, we've seen that change. And at Brightwire, we've had conversations as a team. You know, even at corporate, corporate clients have uh, really casual Fridays. We might be casual, but we won't wear jeans because we differentiate ourselves and we hold ourselves to a very high professional standard. And therefore we work with organizations that have the same values and that works for us. So it's just unique to the industry and it's something for sure to consider. So what, what other questions come to mind? Personal brand, this is generally a, a, a really um, a topic with a lot of different perspectives and experiences. And you can type it into chat. Darby's watching chat for us if there's anything coming up there. There's nothing right now. I'm just so you know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think I'm a challenge at... for me, sorry, this is Juliet. And it took me a while to think about this question. Um, but I think a challenge for me is balancing personal brand between professional and really like personal and who I am. So for example, um, I am um, a senior manager enterprise excellence in a healthcare pharmaceutical company, but I also on the side just launched my own business in fashion, which is totally different. Right. Um, so it's now trying to figure out how do I bring that together? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Julia. And that, uh, that congruency factor is really important because if I experience you one way and I experience you a different way, it's hard for me to interpret who you really are. And therefore, I will, I'm likely to trust you less. Uh -huh. um, it is in, very important with this. So I, I appreciate your question. And that's often one that we receive, like, how can I you know, be this, you know, super fun person, more casual on the weekends and be really professional at work. Well, what values do you have and are they consistent? Mm -hmm. So for, for example, I stand for taking challenges and turning them into learning opportunities every moment of every day. That's for me, my personal brand statement amongst many other attributes. And that to me shows up when I'm rushing the trails at the Nordic Center and Camar on the weekend and coaching my children to run behind me on their mountain bikes, right through to how I handle executives with some of the, you know, North America's leading organizations and challenging them on their people development strategies. The way that I take opportunities or challenges and translate them into opportunities to learn is something that you're going to see for me where I'm, whether I'm wearing a helmet or I have my hair done. Right? So it's a really consistent way to feel and engage with somebody. And that's why it's important to go beyond, obviously, the look and the appearance side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my takeaway from your comment is 
that um, it's more so about the mindset and your approach and then uh, rather than applying it into different uh, settings. So as long as the mindset and the approach is consistent, it's going to come through as trustworthy and authentic. Yes, you got it. And these, that's why we have these questions in here to help you explore that. Because when you know what you stand for, when you know what you believe in, and then the aspirational part, which I also love is what do you want to be known for? Which is very important because we're all about like, not just like today in the present, but like, what does the future hold? That's where you get that continuity in the mindset that ties both of these worlds together. So fashion, you know, um, corporate excellence, as you'd said, there's a lot there, a lot of your transferable skills, the things that you're really good at, arguably have to show up in both those worlds. You have to be innovative. You have to be driven. You definitely have to have tenacity, right? And you could drill all those down to a transferable skill level. If you think about what you're known for and what skills you have, even that's a starting point to be like, hey, you know what? Here's the consistency in terms of what's what, what I'm doing well in both of these areas. And I would bet that others around you are seeing that as well. Now, it's one thing to understand what your brand is, but it's another thing to actually learn how to articulate it and talk about it. And uh, in the book on page 103 and page 104, there are at least 10 strategies that help you articulate your personal brand. So once you've done the math and you've thought it through and you've kind of built a bit of confidence around it, and you pressure tested it with people who are close to you, then how do you actually start to incorporate that into your day to day? Because particularly in an MBA, it's quite the development experience or any, again, education. And you leave that program. And then a lot of people will say to me, well, Christine, like, why haven't I had more opportunities come my way? Why aren't the doors opening for me? Why isn't my boss or why isn't my board or why aren't more clients coming my way? And I often respond with, well, have you told them about what you've learned? And do they know about how you've evolved? And people often assume with social media nowadays and all the ways that we connect virtually that everyone's following along my career path for sure. I got 50 likes on my thing. So that means everyone knows. Well, actually it's the opposite. You should be targeting people who are important to you in your life and actively going out of your way to tell them about how you've evolved. Because otherwise I will just consider you as the same as once I want, how I knew you previously 10 years ago. I had lunch recently, uh, one of my previous EMBA cohort members from 10 years ago reached out and we touched base a few times through the years, but definitely not in the past five. And he moved back to Canada, moved back to Calgary, wanted to reconnect. And in our early, five minutes of the conversation, I realized this gentleman is looking at me through the lens of who I was and the business I led 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, I had a team of three and I worked full time for North America's largest energy infrastructure company, running their leadership development strategy uh, through, a, you know, significant acquisitions and a lot of other really cool projects. And I was like, huh, okay. Like that's when I was corporate and an entrepreneur. And it became very quickly obvious that he didn't know that I had 14 people on my team now and that we were scaled across North America working with different businesses. And I went, I know this, I know this, but right, like this is not a person I would have thought to tell, but it was so obvious to me that he was just looking at me through what he once knew because that's the only information he had. So good lesson learned, right? Whether or not he was a targeted individual or not, it was don't expect people just to follow you you need to particularly tell those that should know where you've been and what you've been up to and how you've evolved as a person. So there are strategies in here to do that. There are strategies in here to help you with your confidence factor as well. That's a great reminder. Thanks so much, Christine. Yeah, thanks, Juliet, of course, for sure. And, you know, I do this all the time and I'm constantly getting reminded myself and I never think that's a bad thing because I'm all about learning, right? The moment I'm not learning, it's just boring. So happy to share any of those learning experiences with you guys for sure. Yeah, thumbs up right back at you. I love it. Okay, so we're going to read one more section. And if you guys have questions, pop them into chat. This one's really cool. This is in the book as well. And it's called the Instant Credibility Statement. So for those of you following along, uh, this is on page 143. 
Um, for those of you after today, we are happy to share the key content slides as well. Just if you want to highlight uh, uh, what we've taken a look at here, you'll have it for future reference. So page, um, I'm sorry, I got that incorrect. I think I was dreaming when I wrote that, but I'm actually on page 151, not 143. The slide is incorrect. So the instant credibility statement, Let's grab a sip of water here. Okay, so this one starts with, hi, I'm someone you're going to remember. As the saying goes, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. As a potential MBA student, a recently graduated MBA student or a seasoned MBA professional, you're looking to meet new people and find new opportunities. Chances are also really good that the way that you've been introducing yourself follows the same tired format favored by networking minglers since the dawn of the after work drink. It's not your fault. We're conditioned to, induce, to introduce ourselves this way. Hi, I'm Renee. I'm the director of communications. What do you do? We've all done it. And it's basically the expected format on how these things should go. But there is a better way. There is a much better way that allows you to be remembered for the things you want to achieve rather than what you've done. So I'm gonna actually pause there and repeat that sentence because even when I read it now, I actually get shivers as to how important it is. But there's a better way, a much better way that allows you to be remembered for the things you want to achieve rather than what you've done. We call it the instant credibility statement and it's about to become your new best introduction. The goal is to create a simple and succinct way to introduce yourself that's meaningful and memorable. A credibility statement can be 30 seconds or three minutes long, and we generally recommend aiming for a statement that's about a minute long. Mastering your credibility statement so that you can deliver it smoothly for your next meeting, networking event, or job interview requires some focus prep and for sure a lot of practice. Let's get shaking hands, now that we can shake hands again, it's kind of cool, and meeting your future. After all, the only way to help people understand what you're capable of is to tell them. So building your instant credibility statement. The instant credibility statement formula has been in use for more than a decade and was created by Christine for executive coaching clients who were looking to make career and leadership pivots. For most, they, have all, they had always been one thing in their career or their lives and they were looking to do something else or looking to be something else or do something else. They wanted to be seen in a new way. The credibility statement allows you to introduce yourself so you remember the way you want to be remembered. And it all happens in an instant, effectively establishing yourself differently than you may have done in the past. We all know how to introduce ourselves based on what we've done, but it's much harder to introduce yourself based on where you want to go, particularly if you don't yet know where you want to go. So fully acknowledge that. That's why we'll focus on your skills to create conversations that'll turn those skills into opportunities for you. When we introduce ourselves based on the career we have, especially during networking events or in a business setting, though it does happen at the bowling lane too, the casual settings. And when we anchor to what we're saying to our past, we're missing an opportunity. The same old introduction can be made stronger by articulating your transferable skills and leaving the person you're talking to wanting more. More importantly, you're shaping how the person will remember you. So here are the components of an instant credibility statement. Who you are, what you do, why you love it, and why the other person should care. And the why the other person should care part is essentially about what's in it for them. Why do they care about what you just told them? And it's generally the handover back to them part of the conversation. So who you are. Be conscious about how you begin, starting with your name and talking about how you fit into the setting. You can use your title if you want, but you don't have to. Include any important identifiers that make you different than anybody else. And it's important to link you with the contact of the place. Are you at the networking event, presentation, social gathering, one-on-one -on -one interview? Establish who you are and your spot in the room. What you do. And, and just to pause for a moment, there are examples as you start to see the personas come up. So we read this and then Jessica's who you are is here. What you do, and then the next page will show you Muhammad's what you do. 
So there's real uh, integration of the personas throughout everything I'm reading. So what you do, this could be your job title or what you do in terms of skills that you deliver. Uh, preferably you wanna lead with your skills rather than your current job or title to establish how you want to be viewed. And we'll come back to that. Why you love what you do. This is the piece that makes you memorable. The meaning you find in your work is unique to you, as is your one-of-a-kind perspective. Statements could include, I love what I do because it enables me to use my MBA education every day to add value. I love what I do because I am able to make a really meaningful impact on others and that feels good. I love what I do because I find great satisfaction bringing many pieces of the puzzle together, et cetera. So think of this as a, a piece, as an opportunity to bring your education in without sounding overly confident or arrogant. Always a reminder worth keeping at the forefront when you're talking about yourself. This is a safe way to talk about your education and experience with great confidence and assertiveness in a way that comes across received as intended. You could also schedule your North Star or include your North Star or link your passion into this introduction. Most importantly, be genuine in your enthusiasm. And the North Star is a concept also talked about in the book that we have not talked about today, just to call that. The last section here, and then we'll pause for questions and curiosities, why they should care. Your goal here is to send the conversation over to the person you're meeting to demonstrate your connection, invite questions, and keep the conversation going. At its simplest, you want to give the person you're meeting something interesting to talk about or to return to something that you have in common. Okay, so who you are, what you do, why you love it, the emotional connection piece, and why that person should care. So in this book, there are many different examples, both mine, Renee's, and then the three personas. And then there's a section on bringing it all together and combining those four elements to actually have a full credibility statement. What we find is, so just putting the book down for a moment, once you have a chance to actually think through some of these variables and write them down, saying it one time or two times out loud gives you the confidence to be able to customize it in the moment to the person that you're talking to and move away from only talking about what you once have done, but bridging in more of what you want to do in the future. So are there questions or comments if we discuss this piece uh, for a moment? And I actually might just move past it in terms of discussion and put up these components here, who you are, what you do, why you love it, and then the so what, why should the person care? Questions, curiosities. You guys want to hear my credibility statement? Shall I give you a, I'm, I'm thinking there's a lot of thumbs up here on the screens, but there you go. Yeah, Julia, there you go. Karen, you popped on. Okay, so I will just jump in. So good morning, everyone. Christine Dashney here. I'm the founder and CEO of Brightwire. And we are a leadership development and professional coaching firm in Calgary that serves clients across North America. As the founder and CEO, I'm responsible for leading a team of 14 of the best and brightest professionals in this space. And I absolutely love what I do because it allows me to help individual teams and organizations experience possibilities that didn't exist for them before working with us. And it feels really, really good. I've been doing this for over 15 years and I use my background in business and my numerous credentials in the space of leadership development to drive tangible results in a skill set area that can sometimes be perceived as soft. And I look forward to sharing more about that experience with each of you today as you read the Intentional MBA, learn more about the book, and learn more about uh, Brightwire and leadership development in general. So there's an example of a credibility statement. And thank you, Wendy, for the applause. There you go, so there you go. So I've done this a few times. And of course, like that seemed polished in like a presentation because I'm looking into my little camera that I've been looking to for a year and a half, right? And I'm talking to you guys, I'm modeling it. But when you're in person, it's a bit more conversational. But notice what I did when I said, um, you know, who I am, it's Christine Dashi's title, it's quick. 
what I do, I went from the company and team to my role very quickly because I'm introducing my credibility. So you have to choose, is it my company's credibility I'm building? Is it my, my team? If you're working for a corporation, it's probably your credibility that you wanna build. The company already has a brand, right? Talking about you. And then when I say what I love, what I do, I add into the mix, my credentials, my background, my numerous industry accreditations, my business education, my 15 years experience. And instead of just listing those things off to you like a roster of things, sounding like I'm so smart and great, I actually integrate them into why I love what I do because I can use my skills to add value. So it's, it's a, a way to have you know what my credentials are in a way that makes you understand how I use them. And if I'm you, I'm listening for that because I care about what's in it for me. And then that bridges beautifully to the so what section, which is so I'm here today to share with you a little bit about that and you know add value to you so that you can take some things away. Okay, so just to break it down further. So what questions do you guys have around that? Questions or curiosities, anything goes. There's no questions in the chat box as of yet, but um, it's not really a question, but because I did my undergrad in communications and business, just having that like structure, kind of like a, not really an S, a mini essay, but it kind of is in some regards of being able to have like the setup and the your proof and your follow through because um, whenever I wrote essays, I like to have some sort of like impactful ending statement. Um, and it is really nice to be able to draw back to like the purpose of why you're having that conversation and bring it back to that person because realistically, we only, we mostly care about ourselves in those regards and like uh, what we're gonna get out of that conversation. Um, and so uh, just appreciating it and its uh, simplicity, but also its impact. Very well said. I love that. Simple and impactful. And you're right. You can use this as a format. Like I've seen cover letters used this way. You're applying for a job. It's like, here, here's who I am, what I do, why I love it, the so what. But here's the differentiating factor I want to leave you guys with. So this is kind of like the light bulb moment or like the main point here that's really articulated well in the book, but I won't keep reading all of it. Um, and I want to come back to that phrase I repeated, which was, this is your chance to create what you want for your future, not just talk about what you've done in your past. So here's, I'm going to give you two examples. It would also be great for your LinkedIn bio. Yeah, you can use it on LinkedIn too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So, so I'm going to tell you a real story and it's sort of written about in the book, but in different words. And I think it's Muhammad's uh, persona. And I'll tell this very quickly. So I, I've actually had new, I've had this happen probably a hundred times at least over the past, you know, maybe three to five years. And so leaders will come to me or members on my team and they will say, and I'll give you a specific example instead of speaking generalities. So I had one senior director come to me one time and say to me, Christine, I want to be a vice president. I need to move up in my organization. I know I'm capable. And I said, okay, Mohammed, we'll use Mohammed's example because these personas come from real examples, right? Without using actual clients names. I said, Mohammed, okay, so just like we're meeting for coffee. I'm the head of whatever energy company. You want to be a vice president for me in uh, pipelines processing and asset integrity, let's say. And so Mohammed said, great. And I said, just introduce yourself to me. Let me just hear how you're positioning yourself right now. And he said, you know what, great. So hi, my name is Mohammed. I've been a technical engineer for 15 years and I do work in uh, pipelines processing. And I use my technical background to be able to ensure that the assets are optimized for the greatest performance for the organization. And um, I'm just looking to develop my career. I've been with this company for a very long time and I'm just looking to develop my career. And I said, okay, that was kind of the gist of it. And I said, okay, so Mohammed, all, all you've told me is you have been an engineer for a very long time. And I was like, but you're trying to make an impression on me that's different. So talk to me about your director. What are the things that you've done in your role that are beyond your technical expertise? He's like, oh, I lead multi-million dollar budgets. I approve significant pro projects for the organization. I present findings to the executive team on the regular basis. And I have to roll up my recommendations to make, to inform the strategy. I said, okay, so let's try it again. So if you introduce me in the first 20 seconds, you tell me you're a pipelines process engineer and you have been for 15 years. As a trained human, we're all trained to be human, right? I'm just like, oh, there he is, categorized engineer. But like, actually he wants to be a vice president. So don't even isolate yourself early in the conversation when you tell me who you are and what you do. 
So Mohammed says to me, okay, so my name is Mohammed and I have been in the space of technical and field development for a very long time, focused in leading a team responsible for making strategic decisions and optimizing assets for a company. And my role specifically in doing that has been looking at the budgets, developing the people below me to help in doing the best work that they can and presenting my findings to the executive team in a way that is, uh, a, they're able to use them to communicate effectively. I love what I do because, and then he built in things about his leadership and the people side and seeing the, vi the vision and the impact of his work on the culture of the company. And I'm looking to do more of that as I evolve my career. So I'm here today meeting with you to share a bit about my background and my aspirations and to learn from you how you, where I might fit into your organization or into what you might know is available out there. So do you guys see the difference? Option one, here's who I currently am and all the things I currently do. Thank you, Juliet. Option two, here's who I am. Here's the things I'm good at. Here's what I aspire to do and how, what can we do together? So in the book, there are very crystal clear examples that when you read them, you're like, oh my gosh, I've been totally introducing myself that way this whole time without a lot of aspiration or future orientation. And again, if that's what you want, then drill in and dig into where you are and, your and what you do in your technical side. The idea behind an instant credibility statement is it allows you to be very intentional about how you communicate and how you come across. Okay, so we'll just leave it there. Super passionate about the stuff as you guys can, uh, as you can see. So there's a bit of a template here. The team's gonna pop into chat, uh, our email address. If you uh, sign up, or if you go to brightwireleadership.com, we have a newsletter where we share a lot of these great tips. It's called the Leadership Accelerator. Uh, we have one coming out early next week. So if you sign up today, you'll get access to it. We have some videos in there and some really cool content. And some of the things that you'll see from us are samples of these type of tools that we share readily with those that we partner with and we support and those that support us. So feel free to sign up for that. And then are there any last burning questions? We wanna make sure we create a bit of space for conversation still, and then allow the WXN team to have some airtime as well to close off the session. So what other questions or uh, curiosities exist? And if not, I have a call to action I'm going to just share with you guys. But yeah, Darby, is there anything coming in into the chat there? So there's nothing in the chat right now. Uh, there's a comment. Uh, thank you so much, Christine. This was an excellent session. I really enjoyed it. I do need to drop off for another meeting. Okay. Thanks, Vina. Um, yeah. um, but I was just looking at the questions that were submitted uh, when people registered for the event, right. um, seeing what wasn't covered, which lots was covered. So that was really good. Um, one question was how to determine your market value if you're a professional with many years of experience and recent, recently completed your part-time MBA. Very specific is that it's quite different from new MBA grads with little work experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. So determining your market value, again, I would just ask like, what does that mean to you? Um, a lot of people ask like, how old is too old to get an MBA? That's and, another question too. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's right too. Um, you know, and my answer is you're never, it's never too old, right? Like you, you know, again, how do you quantify return? If you're 65 or, you know, 60 and you have a couple of years left of your, your formal trajectory or 55 even, you're not, it, well, I can't even say that. I was going to say you're not likely to get the financial return, but you might, you never know. But you need to calibrate your expectations on what return looks like. So I would say, you know, you're, you're really never too old to invest in yourself and particularly an MBA. A lot of people I, I've met with a lot of, um, you know, graduate degree in geosciences, graduate degree in archaeology, graduate degree in the medical field. And doctors are going back to get MBAs because an MBA helps them run their business practices. Right. So we actually do a lot of like business coaching uh, of the 12 professional coaches on my team. I believe more than half of them have MBAs. And so that business acumen is incredibly important for anyone looking to develop or grow, but particularly for people who are heightened professionals looking to scale their businesses. So an in, in MBA is a very universal program. You do have to really look at the specific school, pressure test their curriculum. Some are definitely better than others, that's for sure. 
Um, one of the passion areas that we've had at Brightwire over the years is supporting universities in building out their leadership curriculum. When I took it as a leadership development professional 10 years ago, this is a bit of a tangent, um, I was not pleased with the leadership curriculum and the development for people, particularly because a lot of people assume they're going to get leadership skills from an MBA. Uh, so we proposed to the university uh, leadership development elective program that is still in operation or was in operation for many years. I think last year they augmented it because of the, um, the pandemic and it provided leadership skills to individuals. So look closely at your program. Do they have international trips, business components, et cetera? But the long story short is business skills are universal and you really can't go wrong. You truly can't go wrong as long as your reason for taking an MBA is a good one and it's for you. And so again, in the book, the decision factor sections will help you in navigating that, including how to research the school to go to and what questions to ask and what to look out for. And um, yeah, how to determine your market value. I think get out there, talk to people. You know, it's um, a lot of people are being pleasantly surprised in today's business world and job market around who's getting jobs and not. And leadership styles are evolving in evolution with the job market. And so I would say, don't make a decision that isn't yours to make. Meaning don't limit yourself and assume that you don't have market value go out there, pressure test it, and let others tell you that you do or don't. Otherwise, you'll never know. So it's a, a good question. I'll just leave it there. Yeah, it's a good reminder and like confidence of being able to not hold yourself back with that. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jennifer's asking how you pick the right school. I feel like you kind of touched on that. And um, it sounds like there's a part of the book that touches on that as well. Um, so the last question that I have here from the pre-registration, um, it's kind of asking about your opinion on the main benefits um, about getting an MBA specifically in technology. Yeah, I mean, you got to think about how the world's evolving, technology, information, innovation, ESG. I mean, all those things are evolving industries that supplement business today. Uh, you know, finance is always a good, stable one. Leadership is growing significantly. So I would just, my, my response back would be, is it um, in alignment to what your aspirations are for your career. Look at your conditions of satisfaction, look at the probable career paths for yourself. If technology is a factor, then you're doing an MBA with a major, it's likely something you're gonna be able to get a great advantage from. So again, it's really an individual decision. Yeah, I know locally there's kind of a M, uh, MBA with a twist called MBET, uh, which is Masters of Business Entrepreneurship and Technology. So that kind of reminded me of that one. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's uh, just, you know, catered a bit more towards a different style of leader, more entrepreneur. Yeah. And that also might be something that you're specifically interested in. So, yeah. Um, those are all the questions that I'm having here. Some people are saying apologies that they've run out and um, kind of regards with uh, Happy Thursday, everyone, and take care. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think we're kind of wrapping up. If you want to have any last comments. Yeah, I'm just going to skip to one more slide. So just a call to action for everyone. Um, just being an intentional whatever it is to you today and taking advantage of all the opportunities that exist to develop yourself. Uh, there's a few kind of sub bullets there, but really holding yourself accountable. We work with so many people that, um, you know, have accountability partners in their careers to accomplish their greatest potential. And you don't know what you don't know. So books like The Intentional MBA can help. Uh, services, you know, uh, in terms of professional support services can help. There's a lot of ways and you don't have to have all the answers yourself, but also hold yourself accountable to it because the future is yours to create. And uh, just reflect on your personal brand. We went through that a bit today and uh, challenging you to also um, practice with your instant credibility statement. And when you have a chance to write it down, share it with a friend and then they'll be able to give you some feedback like, oh, you forgot to tell me about this. And that's so important because that's such a great thing about you. So yeah, I just wanted to leave it there and just invite you guys to get a copy of the book. I think the book website should be dropped into chat as well, The Intentional MBA, and it's shipping on Amazon Prime relatively quickly. And you can get it uh, virtually through Indigo and many other sources. So if you have questions, reach out, sign up for our newsletter as well at brightwireleadership.com. And uh, look forward to staying connected with you and all the best to each of you through your development journeys. Thank you for your time today. Awesome. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you, Christine.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining and sticking around. Thank you. Thanks, Darby. Thanks for managing Thank the you. chat. Oh, there you go. There yeah, you go. no worries. Oh, I want to read that chat. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so if you're interested in uh, purchasing the Intentional MBA, a guide to maximizing your decision experience and investment um, by Christine Dejeuner and Renee Francis, then um, be sure to visit the links that Christine had before or um, intentionalmba.com. Our next virtual book club will be in September with Cynthia Lois, uh, co-host of CTV's The Social on her book called Find Your Pleasure. The exact date will be announced soon, so be sure to follow our social media and subscribe to our emails to know when you can register for this exciting event. We would like to thank all of our corporate partners who allow these amazing events like this one and many more to be possible. Join our powerful WXN community today by becoming a member. Enjoy our special of just $99 for a one-year membership, but hurry, this special offer is almost over. Learn more on the membership page of our website. In May, we held our first annual Canadian Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Virtual Summit, where we launched our 2020 annual report card and spent two days in important discussion and actionable next steps. The 2020 annual report card specifically pertains to the year of radical change we have all experienced and measuring the evolution of women's rise to the top of corporate Canada as a result. You can learn more and download this valuable report on our website. We encourage you to join our Monday Mojo virtual event series where WXN ambassadors lead lively and informative conversations about life, career, and staying in touch with your inner mojo magic. Be sure to sign up on the event page of our website for these events in July, October, and November so far. As you may have already seen on our website, social media, and events calendar, our 2021 theme is Stand in Raw Courage, raw standing for radically authentic women. Join us for courageous conversations, hands-on workshops, and discussion about how to harness your own courage. We thoroughly enjoyed and grew from our spring events and look forward to the upcoming fall events. Thank you for attending and participating in our webinar. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.